والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد We gave part one of Surat Al-Asr last week and this will conclude insha'Allah tafsir Surat Al-Asr The last point and this is the proof on the four fundamental principles. Surat al-Asr is the proof on the four fundamental principles. The last point we spoke about last week was that Allah gives an oath by that which he wills and humans only give an oath by Allah. Allah can give an oath by creation. We can only give an oath by Allah. Let us go back to a term, wal-Asr. Allah gives an oath to show the value of time by al-Asr. Therefore, don't waste time. Keep in mind that the shaitan has tactics in killing your time. That's why when it comes to good productive stuff that benefits you in the hereafter and even in this world, he casts boredom and laziness on you. Be alert for such tactics and know how to deal with them. If it's something vain or sinful, the shaitan puts joy to it. And that's one of the traps of the shaitan. You find that one, for example, can stand in a parking lot when he sees a friend and he'll talk to the friend and hours and hours will go by, possibly backbiting or maybe in, in maybe in even just vain talk. Hours go by and one feels as if it's only a few minutes. Maybe even neutral stuff that's talked about, maybe mubah. The shaitan doesn't care as long as he can keep you away from obedience out of envy that he doesn't want you to do that which he's deprived of. Suddenly you go home and you're too bored to stand up for five minutes in Qiyam al night. Or the Imam in Salat al-Isa or Salat al-Fajr reads what the Prophet ﷺ used to read and one starts to shake his legs and move in boredom and starts looking at his watch or in the sky and that's what you see of their appearance and what's in the hearts, hearts could be even possibly more. You find people who are sitting with friends at such ease and peace, fully attentive and engaged into conversation as if they have no worries. And basically if you ask them, they probably tell you, we forget our worries when we're talking to our friends. And if he breaks for salah, suddenly the shaitan comes to him and reminds him of the stresses of life and school and tests and appointments and kids and other matters to distract him from that which benefits him in the hereafter. A true believer, a true believer, his coolness, the coolness of his eyes is in salah and dhikr. The Quran and Sunnah states though, today the coolness of the eyes has become in everything outside or except dhikr and salah. So Allah gives an oath by al-asr, by time, to draw attention to time. You're made of time. You're made of seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years. You are made of that. When today leaves and today ends, you bury the portion of you. That's what you got to think. When you pray Salat al-Maghrib every day, that's the end of our day. Maghrib after that is the beginning of the following day. You've buried a part of you right there and then. One is like a building. Your age may be 20, you may be 20 stories up, maybe 75 stories high rise. Every day that goes by, a brick is taken off that and placed in the hereafter. Every sunrise and then sundown, that you don't gain deeds is a day you'll regret. If it's in haram, we all know that. If it's in normal mubah stuff, it'll be regretted because you didn't gain a higher level in Jannah. You're made up of time. Time passes 
and we enter Jannah based on what we invested in our time. Wal Asr. That's why Allah gave a note by Al Asr. Minutes passing are your principle. They're your capital. Every day that passes by, you bury a day out of your life. The next point. What's the subject matter of the oath? What is so important that Allah needed or wanted to give an oath about? What is it so important that he wanted to draw our attention to look into? Inna al-insana lafi khusr. The subject matter of the oath is that everyone is at a loss. Allah is given an oath on al-asr. That man is at a loss. Mankind is at a loss. What's the relationship between choosing al-asr to give an oath by and the fact that everyone is at a loss? Why didn't he give an oath, for example, by one of his many other creations right here in the surah? Asr is your life. It's the token of time. And how you use al-asr, your asr, your time, is a determining factor if you will be among the winners or among the losers. So it best coincides that time be what Allah uses to give an oath by and Allah makes the best of all choices. Inna al-insana. Insana, mankind. If you're mankind, this applies to you. Insan is all mankind. There's a dispute. Some said it's the kafir. Some said it's all mankind. And it's probably more correct to leave the Quranic verses general like in this one. If there's no proof to restrict it. And that was the opinion that ash shanqiti went by. Inna al-insana lafi khusur. Lafi. Lam in lafi. Is to confirm. We talked about that last week. Khusr. Khusr comes in a noun form. Loss. Instead of a verb. Khusr comes as a noun instead of a verb. To give an everlasting powerful meaning. Allah did not say khasr. He's losing. Allah did not say laqad khasr. He's losing. Allah said khusr in a noun form. Khusr in a noun form. Let me give you an example to better understand how delicate the linguistic words of the Quran were chosen. One can be a millionaire and he loses a thousand dollars. He's a khasr. He is a millionaire. What's a thousand dollars to a millionaire? He's a khasr. But he's not a total loser because what's... A thousand dollars is really nothing, even though he lost, but it's really nothing for a millionaire. Now, if a millionaire, that same millionaire, lost billions, now he's in debt, now he's encircled with loss, then the term khusr, complete loss, applies to him. Tremendous loss. He's no longer khasr. He's in khusr. He's encircled in loss. Khusr means complete, total loser. Complete total loss, encompassed, seized, totally by loss, encircled by loss, at loss from head to toe. Another linguistic lesson. Lafi khusr, or is it lafi al khusr? It's lafi khusr. It's, it's mentioned as a nakira. That's nakira. Lafi khusr instead of lafi al khusr. There's two reasons for this. The two reasons for this. Khusr as in Nakira over Al Khusr. It comes to show number one how big of a loss. That's why it's mentioned as a Nakira. Lafi Khusr instead of Lafi Al Khusr. Arabic people use Nakira without Al to show something that is mighty and devastating and how big it is. So this is to show how big of a loss it is. Another linguistic lesson is Allah used Fi in. Fi in. Instead of Ala an. Ala means an. In another verse, when Allah talks about guidance, He says, Ula'ika ala hudan. They are an guidance. He didn't say fi over there. Why did He use fi instead of ala here? Because He's fully surrounded deeply with loss. 
he's not analos, which may appear, he's not ala analos, ala analos, which may appear to indicate a slightly, slighter, slightly lesser degree of a loss. He used fi to indicate how big of a loss it is. He is in total loss. He's not near or close to a loss. He is encircled in a loss. All those unique, detailed linguistic lessons show how big of a loss this is we're talking about over here. The loss here is not a transaction or two. It's not a season or two. It's not a semester or two. It's not a quiz. It's not a test. It's not a business deal. This loss here is loss of a capital. It's loss of profits and it's complete debt. Major loss. It's also not a temporary loss. It's an everlasting loss. If one is in hell, he's doomed. Nas'alullah al -afiyah. If he's in heaven, then he may have not gotten the highest strength that he should have gotten. It's a loss right there too. Let me give you a practical example as it pertains to the surah. A winner and someone who lost his profits First one is a winner, then one who lost his profit, and then the third one is one who lost his capital, his profit, and he is in debt. You go, you, you return from work or school. And since we said al-asr may mean the time at the end of the day when someone begins to think about what he did during that day, you return at night, you visit relatives, you teach your kids Quran, you play with them, you uh, make salah, fard or nafil, you may have relationship with your wife. Maybe you review Quran. Maybe go online, listen to a lecture. Maybe listen to Quran. Uh, maybe go out working with, uh, working out with the right intention. Maybe even sleeping, sleeping, taking a nap with the right intention. If you intended and you said, I want to get a few minutes of sleep so I can re-energize after this long day and uh, so I can wake up uh, for Qiyam. It'll help me get up for Qiyam. And because there's a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, you get, get some qaylula during the day, sleep, nap at the day, so it'll help you wake up at night. So that is a winner. He used his time to his advantage. That's number one. Number two is someone who came back from a bad day. You usually come back from work or school upset or thinking or worried and you're brainstorming and you're thinking, uh, sitting there just merely thinking about what happened. Anything you do idle, where you're not gaining deeds, you're at a loss. You lost profit. You lost profit. You may have not gotten sins. We're not saying you got sins for sitting there and thinking and drooling over what happened. But that same time is a loss because you didn't take advantage of that time. What's the surah start with? Al Asr. Time. Time. Any businessman will tell you money you have. You stack away. That's not invested is money lost. Money not invested is money lost. Take it and say, time not invested for your akhirah is time lost. It's so simple to get ajr. In fact, with the right intention, there's nearly nothing you can't get ajr on. You go work out with the right intention, ajr. You sleep. You sleep and take a nap with, right, uh, with, uh, with the right intention, ajr. You play with your kids, ajr. Now the third one, the third scenario, is one that will return from work, use that time to hang out with his friends. He uses that time to hang out with his friends. Now what's a common epidemic today in settings? Backbiting, gossip, watching that which is prohibited, maybe listening to the instruments of the shaitan, sit in with your friends or going on the net and typing away in the honor of those dead and alive. You see in here of rogs who don't know if they'll wake up Muslim or otherwise performing dissection in anatomy with their tongues on the honor of people whose destiny is now with Allah. There are those, there's people who are done deal. Allah's dealing with them. Allah is dealing with them. 
They are now with Allah, Allah is dealing with them. Then you got people who perform dissection on those whose souls are possibly inside green birds tending to the rivers of paradise and eating from the fruits of Jannah and returning to hang on the throne of Allah. All that while some rog is sitting dissecting them with his tongue does not know he himself whether he will wake up as a Muslim or a Munafiq. If Allah prohibited if Allah prohibited backbiting amongst two people for moments, if two people for just a few moments backbite, it's considered a major sin. That's backbiting and that's a major sin. If it's only for moments and just amongst two people, it's a major sin when it's among two. In the reality, if you think about it, when two people talk about someone, each party departs and possibly forgets that which they said and go about their way. That's major sin and backbiting, even if they forgot about it on the spot. And that's among the major sins. Now imagine a sin like that when it's among a group. How big of a sin it is when it's in a group. Now take it further, imagine the sin when it's put on a social media for the world to see, not for this time period, but for generations to come and possibly until the judgment day. Wallahi, one who truly believes in the akhirah and the punishment of the grave and lets that register in his mind, he would never go to that extreme. One will lie in his grave with torment, seizing him from every angle for hundreds of years, possibly thousands of years, until the trumpet is blown in for words he posted on the net he thought they were nothing, but to Allah they were very severe. I say, I say, amongst the most dangerous sins after shirk are the sins that pertain to the rights of others. Be careful in your time. That's why we're mentioning this, because this is stuff that happens during your time. We deal with the ghafoor and rahim. When you read about the mercy of Allah and the shafa'ah, you get ecstatic in hope. There is a type of sin that is a double-edged sword. And that's the sins that transgress upon others. Like killing, like backbiting, like taking the properties of others, like slander of others. You can raise your hands in two seconds and ask Allah for forgiveness. You're dealing with a ghafoor or rahim. But there's another right, double-edged sword. There's another right pertaining to the human who's going to come and request it from you when you stand before Allah. When people pass, pass over the sirat, obstacle after obstacle, terror after terror, Allah called it, زلزلت الساعة شيء عظيم. The wait for the judgment day is terror. The questioning before Allah is terror. The mizan is terror. Get in the books. Walking on the sirat. Now, Finally, you made it through all that and you're on the sirat, you're crossing a sirat and there are people who are making it to the front yard of Jannah in Sahih Bukhari. إِذَا خَلَصَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ مِنَ النَّارِ حُبِسُوا بِقَنْطَرَةِ بَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ فَيَتَقَاضَوْنَ مَظَالِمَ كَانَتْ بَيْنَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا حَتَّى إِذَا نُقُّوا وَهُذِّبُوا أَذِنَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ أَذِنَ Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu in hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari said, When the believers cross over hellfire, over the sirat, they're stopped at a bridge called Al-Qantara, an art bridge called Al-Qantara, before they get into paradise. What's that bridge for? They will be given retribution, for injustices between them until they're fully purified. Then after they're purified from rights amongst each other, then they'll be told, you can enter Jannah. Qantara may be the edge, the last portion of a sirat, but I believe from what I read, I, I believe it's actually uh, 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 another bridge, a second smaller bridge after a sirat, that's like a detour for believers, of this ummah who have rights amongst each other before they get to step 
on the front yard of Jannah. Whoever contemplates and fully realizes the Akhirah, and sit, when you think about it, as it's happening before you, that what I just told you, sit and imagine it before you. You could never commit a sin like this. Can you imagine the excitement? You pass all through all those phases, one after the other. You, you just finished passing the claws that take you, kalalib, that take you and pull you from the sirat onto Jahannam. You just pass that phase. Just as you're about to put your foot in the front yard of Jannah, one group goes forward to the front yard of Jannah Joyce, and another group goes to Al-Qantara to settle the disputes they had between Muslims and get purified before they're allowed to enter the front yard of Jannah. Is anyone, anyone, anyone worth stopping you for a millisecond from putting your feet on the front yards of Jannah? Imagine with me. Ask you by Allah to imagine with me. That you're on the Qantara. Jannah is an eyesight away. You can see Jannah from the Qantara. You get in sins of someone you despise so much that you spoke about him and slandered him. Can you feel the agony you're going to be going through? Because still at this point, after this point, Allah is going to remove all heart feelings. But at this point, you're going to feel the pain of it. You, can you feel the agony? of being imprisoned on the Qantara, watching your level in Jannah from Firdaus drop down and down and down and down. Are I said away from you? Can you imagine the agony of seeing people in the front yard of Jannah, some people possibly crowded about Ibrahim alayhi salam, some people going to Nuhi alayhi salam to meet with him, some people going with Aisha to meet the wife of the Prophet alayhi salam, some going to meet Khalid ibn al-Walid and Abu Ubaidah, smiling and joyous, they made it to the front yard of heaven, and you're there on the Qantara getting your ranks stripped down, one after the other, for something you said about a believer, or something that you took away from the rights of a believer. The one you despise so much, is he worth the most valuable asset that you have? Your ranks in Jannah? If indeed you want to backbite, then slander your mom and your dad, or your sheikh, or someone you really love. Because if you get stopped on the Qantara, it'll be your mom and your dad getting their ranks higher, while yours gets lower. Why did the Prophet ﷺ call someone who transgresses on another's rights bankrupt? Ask people who know finance. If no one has, if someone has no wealth, zero, do you call him bankrupt? No, you don't call him bankrupt. Someone you refer to as bankrupt is not someone who never had nothing. It's someone who has a lot and then lost it. Those who slander backbite, transgress on the honor and the rights of others. They have deeds, lots of deeds. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, like Jibal to Hama, huge mountains of deeds. But they become bankrupt, they lose it all. They hit someone, he takes some ajr. They slander, that person gets some ajr. You really get amazed at how loose some tongues are and how released some jaws are when it comes to the honor of their brothers. Because they don't really comprehend this. The akhirah in them is, 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 not, is not really deep in their hearts. Basically, we gave scenarios right now of how one took advantage of the hour and became a winner. The middle one was a loser because even though he didn't commit sins, he didn't gain no ajr, that's considered a loss. Time not invested in the akhirah is a loss. In the final scenario we took is not only one who didn't gain ajr, but he gained sins and he became a bigger loser or has a bigger loss and he didn't spend his time positive or neutral, he actually spent it to accumulate sins. What makes one at a deep loss, lafi khusur, is that he brought this onto himself with his own actions. No one forced him. No one forced him. No one put a gun to his head and told him. It was his choice. And it was, it, it, it was his choice through his body parts and those will be testifying against him on the judgment day. So the first reason for khusr instead of al khusr is to show how big of a loss it is. That's why it's mentioned in Anakira. The second reason for khusr over al khusr and mentioned in Anakira is tanwir. That the losses are level. 
Losses are levels. Look in the Quran. There's many verses. الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَهْلِيهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ وَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ هُمُ الْأَخْسَرُونَ So the Quran gives levels. Levels of those at loss. You got a khasr and you got a akhsar. Meaning their levels. Not all losers are on the same level. So here, it's one khusr completely encircled with loss. That's the second reason for the linguistic use of a nakira khusr instead of al khusr. Wal asri inna al insana lafi khusr. Okay, the next one. Illa al ladhina amanu. إلا الذين آمنوا. Notice how Allah generalized that everyone is at a loss, then drew an exception. Everyone's at a loss. That's the verse. And then He made the exceptions. إلا is the exception. Why didn't the verse state that everyone succeeds and then make exceptions to the losers? For example, why wasn't the verse Everyone's a winner, except. Why is it everyone's at a loss, except? The reason is because the verse goes to reiterate what I mentioned the week before last. That usually the majority are vilified. So Allah generalized based on the fact that the majority are the ones who are astray. I mentioned, not last week, but the week before last, Four or five verses uh, showing that the Quran mentions the majority in a vilified way. And that the, those people who are on the truth are usually a minority and they're praised. And I mentioned for each side approximately four or five verses. That's the reality. What Allah stated is the reality, no doubt. That's the Quran, that's the word of Allah, the Creator. The world has seven billion humans on it. Out of the seven billion, 1.6 billion are who fall under the name Islam. Out of the 1.6 billion, you gotta start cropping out. You gotta crop out. You gotta crop out those who don't make the salah. Crop out those who have corruption, major corruption in their aqidah, like the major shirk in them. Then you got to crop out the Shia and go on and go and crop. How much you have left? The Arabic language comes like that. If the majority were hungry and there's only a few who are left, you say everyone was hungry except. illa. If everyone accepted your wedding invitation except three or four people, you say, Anasu atau illa. People attended my invitation except, meaning the majority attended. Okay, if, uh, uh, if, if, if most did not accept your wedding invitation, you flip it around. You say, Lam yati illa. No one attended except. That's the proper Arabic language. You start with the general majority of something and then you draw the exceptions. Here in this, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسُرْ إِلَّا Here it's to show that those at a loss are the majority which is consistent with the more direct verses we mentioned two weeks ago. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ Note when Allah said all mankind are at a loss. He didn't tell us why they were at a loss. He did not say they're at a loss because they gamble, because they drink, because they fornicate, and the list goes on and on and on. He didn't say that. He didn't give us the details of why they're at a loss. He could have said, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسُرْ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا وَزَنَوا وَقَتَلُوا وَنَهَبُوا and he could mention characteristics of those, why they're at a loss. Instead, Allah told us the exempted and uh, 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 those who are exempted and the qualities of the winners. He went to tell us 
the quality or the outlines are the winners instead of telling us the details of those who are at a loss or the losers. Why? Because speaking about the losers is endless. It'll go on forever and ever. So many characteristics, so many types. There's many reasons for being a loser. But the outline for being among the winners, the ones who are successful, is simple. It's a simple, easy outline to follow. What are they? They're the four fundamental principles that we've been talking about for the past 11 or 12 classes that we've been teaching. That's why the Quran, in other verses, speaks about the straight path as a singular path. And even in some hadith, it's a single path. It comes in singular form. When he speaks about other paths, it comes plural. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ Verily, this is my straight path. Path. So follow it and follow not the other paths. Paths. Sirati is singular. My path is singular. One simple path. Subul, the deviant paths, is plural. So one, the right path comes as singular, and the deviant path is comes as plural. Okay, illa ladina amanu. Illa ladina amanu. This is the first principle of the four fundamental principles that the author of Usul al Thalatha called the first four, first of the four fundamental principles of the introductory principles in the book. You remember he said the first principle is to know. To know Allah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the book. Why do you know about Allah? Why do you need to know about Allah? And his Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the book. In order to believe. Amanu. Illa ladhina amanu. Knowledge is what gets you to believe in Allah, his messenger, books and angels. We don't need to talk about this since it was covered in detail when we talked about the four, four, first of the four fundamental principles. What may confuse someone though is the author in the book, in our book right before us, he mentioned the principle as knowledge. But here, when we look at it in Surah Al-Asr, in the verse it says, Iman, illa ladhina amanu. But the author mentions it as knowledge. In knowledge in Allah, the Prophet, in the book. Because the author is trying to get, to, to get this principle to you of Iman. The principle of Iman to you. But the only way you can get Iman is through knowledge. Can there be real Iman without knowledge? No. So that may cause a confusion as to how, why the author mentions it as knowledge. And in the surah he uses it as proof. It's mentioned as Iman. Iman is the fruit of knowledge. It's derivative from uh, knowledge. That's why the author, in number one, he says knowledge. And he specified, no, he specified knowledge in Allah, the Prophet, in the book. There can't be Iman without knowledge. Can you get an orange without a tree? The tree is knowledge. The fruit, whether it may be an orange or an apple, those, the fruit is iman. The tree is knowledge. You can't get a fruit without a tree. So when the author said knowledge, and knowledge in Allah, the Prophet, and the book, it means iman in this verse because the purpose and goal of your knowledge in those matters is to have iman in them. Okay, why didn't the verse in Surah Al-Asr tell us what to believe in? Allah said, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Allah said, except those who believe, period. Here, He didn't tell us in detail what are the aspects of believing. Here, there's three points I want to mention. Allah did not detail iman in this verse. Because of A, it's obvious. B, it's known. C, there's plenty of verses throughout the Quran and Hadith to know what Iman is. That clarify this matter and situation. For example, 
I have one car. And you came with me in that car. And on our way leaving right now, I hand you the keys and I tell you, go pull my car. I'm standing on the sidewalk and I say, go pull my car. Would it make sense for me to say, go pull up my red Chevy or whatever car I have with the license plate so-and-so? You just came with me. You know what car it is. You know which car it is. So I say, just go pull up my car. Same thing with Iman. The second point is, when Allah left Iman open-ended, it's to believe. Leaving it open-ended like that means to believe in all of what one is supposed to believe in. Not one aspect and leave other aspects. All of Iman. Meaning, it becomes general. When Allah left it open, and it means it becomes general to encompass all of Iman, so that it includes Iman in Allah, the angels, the books, the messengers, the qada and qad, and the details of all of that. The third point is, when Allah left believing open-ended, it meant believing in the guidance of Allah, and not every myth, fable, and superstition that you come across. For example, we have solid hadith. And even before that, we have Quran that tear a heart in fear pertaining to the punishment of the grave or matters of the akhirah. Yet, some people don't get moved by it because the iman is not fully rooted in it. There is also lack of understanding of the Quran. But then you get a story. You can smell it's fabricated a million miles away about someone who, for example, got buried, and the guy who buried him dropped his wallet in the grave. Then when everyone was sleeping at night, he remembered his wallet, so he went and dug up the grave to get his wallet, and no one seen it but him. And then he found that body charcoal, and his face was flipped opposite of the Kaaba. And then to top it off, you scroll down, and you find if you don't pass this on to 10 people, you're going to die, or your family members are going to die. When Allah said to believe here, it's to believe in the verses, Iman, in the guidance, not to, believe, not to be, Islam doesn't want you to be feeble-minded. A believer is clever, a believer is clever, clever and astute, a believer is smart. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Isra, and the Quraysh got a hold of Abu Bakr, they said, now we got Abu Bakr, the Siddiq. This was before the Prophet ﷺ got to him. They said, listen to this one, Abu Bakr. Your friend, he come up with this big one. Can you believe your friend went from Mecca to Aqsa and returned with, and then to the seven skies and returned and went less than one a night? The man who's called a Siddiq, he was a believer. He was a believer those who this verse talks about, Amen. He was a believer in guidance, not a fable-minded man. He set the rules straight. And he said the statement straight in a few words. He said, if he spoke it, it is the truth. In kana qala faqad sadaq. Meaning, you guys, you guys are probably liars. But if this really came from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's true. It's done deal. If it's in the Quran, if it's in the authentic hadith, whether it enters your mind or doesn't enter your mind, we really don't care about your mind. But don't be gullible to believe in everything you hear. Those who do good deeds. This is the second one. Amanu, the first ones believe. Do good deeds. Allah in 51 verses directly, directly combined between Iman and good deeds. Iman must have actions and conduct. Note, note the order of how action comes after knowledge. There can be no good deeds except after Iman, which cannot happen without knowledge. So knowledge then Iman, one and two, or you can put those at the same level actually. And then the next one is to act on it. This is proof that there's no Iman without action. Those you confront about performing uh, actions of Islam, and then you, know, you get the answer always, Iman is in my heart. 
The Quran, when combined between Amen وعمل الصالحات 51 times, in reality, declares them liars. Those are liars. We're not talking about someone who said his shahada in Dhuhr and before Asr, he died. And you say, oh, is he a Muslim or not? He didn't have the opportunity to exercise any of the actions in Islam. We're not talking about exceptional situations like that. Exceptional situations where the timing of any obligatory act never occurred. We're talking about deceivers who live a life long time, void of deeds, and when you approach them, they say, Iman is in my heart. Iman is like a seed. It's like a seed in the heart. And it's also like a seed when you want to grow a flower. If you don't give that seed water, if you don't care for it, if you don't nourish it, what happens to that seed? That seed dies. It never grows. If that seed stays there for two, three weeks with no action, no care for it, that iman, that seed, dies and becomes worthless. So you need deeds to liven your heart. Al-iman, hayat al-qulub. Al-iman, hayat al-qulub. Iman is your internal life. Internal life. Wal-amalu hayat al-zahir. Actions are your external life. Nothing can have life internally and not externally. Or the opposite. And if they do have life, one way or the other, not the other, it's going to be temporary, and the other missing half is going to kill the other half. Those who say they believe and stay weeks, months, or years void of action, yet claim Iman, they in reality have the traits of the shaitan, or the traits of Kuffar Quraysh, or even Fir'aun. Look at the verse of Allah. وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتَا أَنفُسُهُمْ The Kuffar, Allah is talking about him, said, وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتَا أَنفُسُهُمْ Surah An-Namr. They belied in the ayat, though their own selves were convinced. Inside, internally, Allah, Allah who knows in the heart, said, Internally, in their hearts, they had Iman. They internally had conviction. But their outer actions resisted and they were declared as disbelievers. Those who claim to believe void of actions in their life resemble Fir'aun because deep down Fir'aun was like this category among those who believed in his heart. How? Pay attention. Between Fir'aun's status, where he used to say, Ana rabbukum al-a'la, I'm your supreme lord, and saying, I believe in the lord of Musa. He said that in his last moments. Between the two, between the two is moments. When one gets afflicted, he usually turns to that which is genuinely in his heart. You see someone astray for 50 years, or more, or less, he may be in the peak of his arrogance. Then he gets told he got cancer and he's going to die. Suddenly, he turns to Allah. Someone I know of recently, I heard of from his family member. Someone who used to go to the extent that the curse of Allah was on the tip of his tongue. He goes to the hospital in a painful disease. Very painful disease. Suddenly, this arrogant tyrant who used to slander and curse Allah is telling his family to teach him how to make salah and he begs them for forgiveness for violating their rights. What makes the hidden truth surface in that hardship? Does one acquire the truth so suddenly and drastically after being ill? Or was it buried within him and it got dusted off with the calamity? Usually, those sudden drastic changes like that are the result of the truth being buried. The calamity comes and dusts off that and the truth surfaces. It's like a red carpet. Probably the best way to explain it is like a red carpet. A red carpet over time, especially in our old countries, the dust is in that region. Uh, you take a stick, which is like the calamity, you hit that red carpet, the red color resurfaces. The point is the truth 
is in a lot of the kuffar who Allah spoke about. Allah said, وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا the, the truth is within them. They're certain about the truth in their hearts. But it was useless because there was no acts to follow along with it. The acts of the tongue, the acts of the body parts. The truth was hidden in Fir'aun. It did not help him because there was no act. In fact, the acts resisted that which was in the heart. The summary and point is that internal belief in Iman must coincide with the external belief, which is action. If one claims he has internal, and time and time and time passes with absolutely no external practice, he's not a believer. The best example that I've been using for possibly two decades is no matter, in matters of life, would one be satisfied with another person with just the heart belief, heart love, when we deal with each other? If you don't accept matters in this life with the heart only, then how can you be, how can you expect that they be accepted in the matters of the life after? If a husband tells his wife, I love you, and I love you, and I love you, all day and all night, yet he does absolutely nothing to show that love. No job to support her, does not take care of the kids, does not help her around the house, sits on the couch all day and tells his wife he loves her. What's the common statement? That the wife says, if you love me, you would show it. If you love me, you would show it. And then, of course, she's going to go to the sheikh and file for khulaf. If you do good in work, in school, your teacher, your boss, whatever it is, says, I like you. You did absolutely great. And he showers you with the most eloquent praises. He loves you. Your natural reaction is, if I'm all that, then show me. Show me. If I'm good, then where's the grade? Where's the A+, plus? where's the promotion, where's the raise? The flip side of this is, the flip side of this is action with no internal iman is very dangerous as well. The peak of deeds is for the apparent deeds, apparent deeds to coincide with the internal iman. Those who have deeds with no internal foundation have in reality aspects of the munafiqeen and uh, the hypocrites and flip-floppers. Those are the people who you really find with relapse. Those are the relapse in their belief. The ones who relapse are this kind of category. You see him with the appearance that he's a true devout Muslim. To you, that it appears like that. Then suddenly... He's the total opposite. Those are the people who really in reality had the external, but not were hollow internally. Let me give you an example. All this is cleared by examples. That's why I have to give you an example for each one of these. Early in this century, there was a man called Abdullah Al-Qasimi. He lived from 1907 to uh, 1996. He was born in Saudi and he went in exile. He exiled himself to Egypt. He wrote books defending Islam. He wrote books defending Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. He wrote books refuting sects. He wrote books refuting atheism. This was in the early part of the century. Abdullah Abu Sam, one of the Imams of the Haram back in the days, he died 1952, Rahmatullah Alayh. He wrote a poem commanding this man, Abdullah Al Qasimi. He wrote a poem for his great knowledge, for his service to Islam. Abdullah. Uh, Al Qasimi wrote books. I read a lot of his books, and truly, his old books you benefit from them. He has a book, for example, As Sira' Bain Al Islam Wal Wathaniyya. Very, his most popular book. He has a book called Al Buruq Al Najdiya. He, he, he responds to those who, who claim that one can have intercession with uh, creation. May basically taken about the major shirk. He has a book called. Uh, uh, he, he rep responds very eloquently to atheists who, want, who, who claim reason over proof. He has a book called Al Fasl Al Hasim Bain Al Wahhabiyin Wa Mukhalifiyin. And he has another book called Shiyukh uh, Al uh, Azhar. And he has another book called Al Thawra Al Wahhabiyya. Books 
where he defends the true Tawheed and the followers of the true Tawheed. Uh, he has a book called Naqad, uh, 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 a book called Haya, the popular book Hayat Muhammad. He uh, uh, has a book with commentary on that book. If you read his books, or if he had back then tapes or YouTubes, this would have been an imam, on the, the big, one of the biggest imams on the path of Salaf. Vigorously defending Islam and the core of Tawheed. Not just regular Islam, the core, core of Tawheed. That's how it looked. That's how it appeared. That's how it appeared. But was it really like that? In reality, he's an example of one whose actions, whose outer action, did it match his internal action. Like the many of the ignorant heads that you see today. Maybe not at the same level of him, but it's the same problem. Those who went from apparent talk of ayat and hadith and tawheed and sayings of the salaf, they went from that 15 years ago to suddenly they're now modernists or right at the border of being modernists. From uttering Quran and sunnah to being more like now political analysts worthy of, instead of talking Quran and sunnah, they're worthy of taking the position of John King on CNN. Uh, one, some who, whose present day recordings refutes their recordings 15 years ago. And 15 years ago recordings refute their present day talk and writings. Those are the people, both in the East and the West. They're, they're available in the East and the West. The reality is they may not have gone to the extreme of Al-Qasimi who went to an atheist after defending Tawheed. But they have aspects of the common denominator is the internal didn't match the external. That's a problem. I'm saying it's not as bad as Al-Qasim because he went to a full-blown atheist. But these people, the internal didn't match the external. For example, Al-Qasim, who went from defending Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab to a pure atheist. Later on, why I say didn't match? Later on, some of his close friends said, that when he was writing these hardcore books on Tawheed and Aqeedah, defending Islam, in his private settings with them, he would debate with them matters that were extremely unusual. They would say, how could this man talk about this? One of his friends, I read once, one of al Qasim's friends said, at the time he was defending Aqeedah and uh, Tawheed, in his super settings, he would raise issues doubting the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and Allah. We didn't know about that. We seen the surface of his books. Then his friend said, then I would see him in a gathering in the daytime, teaching to a group and a crowd, Sahih Muslim. So then I say to myself, the talk we had yesterday is just probably shaitanic whispers because it's, it's impossible. At nighttime, he's having doubts in the Prophet sallallahu In the daytime, he's teaching Sahih Muslim. The main diagnosis of the likes of the Qasimi who went from Tawheed carriers and defenders to pure atheists is that there was a mismatch between the internal and the external. The internal iman did not coincide with the external. When you're asking, ask Allah like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The authentic hadith that, that, that the Prophet Sallallahu used to make a dua in a jam al Oh Allah, the turner of the hearts, keep my heart firm on your religion. In reality, that dua means keep my internal and my external running at the same path so I can be and remain steadfast on the tawheed. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ عَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ finally is good deeds. عَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ is good deeds. Act on Islam. This is the second characteristic of the aspects of saving you from being among those that are Allah's. This includes every kind of deed. Both the internal actions of the heart, that's included, and the external by your tongue, your hands, and body parts, that is all included. Any deed is included in this verse, Amilu Salihat. Whether it may be an ordained, whether it may be a sunnah, whether it may be a right of Allah, whether it may be a right of human being, all of that is included in Amilus Salihat. Amilus Salihat encompasses all deeds, heart actions, and body actions. 
وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر advice and recommend to one another with truth and patience وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر these are number three number four of the four fundamental principles is iman is not like a rock they find rocks thousands of years old and they find it just like it was you can have a rock and you put it for centuries to come and it never changes iman is not like that it would be nice if iman like that but iman is not like that iman fluctuates and there are forces behind that fluctuation behind that change you have the force of a nafs in the nafs la amaratun bisu and you also got number two there are three things shayateen al ins and then you got shayateen al jinn which are mentioned in the quran these forces are out to get you sometimes one of them attacks you sometimes two attack you and sometimes you got all three on you attacking you to misguide you sometimes they attack you with full force sometimes they attack you lightly so how do you keep all these forces in check two ways tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bis sabr advice and recommend in truth and patience your brothers your brothers your muslim brothers help you restrain and your muslim sisters help you restrain the evil nafs the temptation the temptation of the shaitan the temptation of the jinn and the ins the evil ins that instigate you to do haram by how by the righteous advising you you need your brothers because when one is alone he melts if you have if you have 10 cups and you put one ice cube in each one of those 10 cups then you have one cup by itself and you have 10 cubes in that cup which one melts faster when each one is individual it's going to melt faster tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bis sabr why did allah say tawasaw instead of awsaw why did allah say tawasaw instead of awsaw the reason for the word tawasaw rather than awsaw is it was used because advising and recommending the truth and patient is not directed to a certain category of believers it's for every believer for every group for every category tawasaw is da'wa da'wa is not a monopoly nor is it exclusive it's not it's not for a certain category over another it's not exclusive for some over another had it been also then yeah it may have been directed to a certain group but when it's tawasa it means it's open for all it's the duty of all it's the duty of all what it's everyone's duty to advise and everyone's duty to accept advice that's what tawasa means instead of also there's no one better than another in this ordeal there's no sheikh immune from this. There's from getting advice. And uh, there's no students. There's no layman immune from getting advice or giving advice. Students, sheikhs, imam, we're all equal. There's no hierarchy in this matter. Everyone in this is all, we're all together in this matter. Like some countries, for example, they have uh, the agency called the Agency of Propagation, the Virtue. Uh, 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 the, the, uh, propagation of virtue and uh, the uh, prevention of vice and some some countries they try to limit ordaining the good in da'wah to that group right there had it been also they would have had proof but when it's tawasu no every believer must advise his brother and every brother must accept we're all in this equal there's no send button, yet no receive. We all got in this matter, a send and a receive button. A believer to a believer is like two hands. One washes the other. One hand can't wash itself by itself. You need another hand to wash the hand. And that's what a believer is to another believer. If you want others to accept your teaching and advice, then you start with yourself. No matter who you think you are, you start by accepting advice of other people. We all have our faults. Wallahi, we all have our faults. And we all have our weakness. The ummah is one body. And we're here to help each other in this weakness. Someone may have a weakness in doubts. Doubts are like shubuhat. 
He gets doubts, for example, about Allah. Many people get that doubt. The shaitan instigates and he reaches a level where he begins to instigate doubts in even Allah, in the existence of Allah. Some people begin to have these shubuhat. But there's another person, a believer, who is strong in resisting the desires, the shahawat, the woman, the musical instruments, and that's called shahawat. The one who's strong in doubts has weakness in looking at haram, for example. So the one strong in an area helps his brother that's weak in the other area. If you're strong in shubuhat, you help your brother who's weak in shubuhat. You're strong in shahawat, you help your brother who's weak in shahawat. The, the tree of iman, in order for it to be sustained, needs to be watered. You nourish your iman by advising each other. Look at the table in your house. You leave for a month or two or you just, you're living in the house and you just don't wipe it out. It becomes dusty. When we advise each other and recommend for each other, it's wiping the dust off the table, off the hearts. Note the surah starts off with iman alone, amanu. Deeds, amilu salihat, it's, it's like, uh, it's alone. More like an individual capacity, amanu, believe. More like an individual capacity. Now when it gets to advising, it's like a group-like setting. Because as a Muslim, you're a member of this ummah. Now it's a group effort. The ummah, all together. All that comes from watawasaw. The third fundamental principle, advising, advising in haq, that's in reality what the author mentioned, da'wah. That's what we talk in the third principle. Haq here, tawasaw bil sabri, wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabri. Haq here is a word used to summarize the revelation of Allah, the Quran and the Sunnah. Tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabri. The fourth fundamental and final principle is here is sabr, patience. Patience comes at the end like a bonus. This is like a bonus. It comes on top of all the good that we've already been talking about in the surah. If you look in between the lines of the surah, sabr, patience, is in reality within the lines of the surah four times. One, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا A great portion of iman comes through sabr. Some scholars were quoted as saying, uh, sabr is half of iman. That's one. It's mentioned in between the lines right there. The second one, الصالحات, those who do good deeds. Isn't sabr, patience, part of good deeds? We said الصالحات is all the deeds. Isn't patience deeds? So it falls under number two. بالحق, give advice. Isn't sabr included in the general word of haq? We said haq is all the Quran and the sunnah. So isn't sabr part of that? So it's in the third one. But then finally, it's specified individually to show how important and essential and mighty it's supposed to be in your life and for you to achieve success. That's why it's mentioned the, uh, as the fourth uh, level uh, of the surah. Patience to be obedient to Allah. Patience to stay away from the sins. And patience on and in trial and tribulations. In class number... Uh, 10 and 11, uh, we talked about patience in depth uh, as the fourth fundamental principle, so there's no need to go over that. We're just talking about these matters in relation to the surah. Keep in mind though, patience here rever re refers to all patience, all type of patience, small matters and big matters. Even patience from boredom, the first thing that I was talking about in the class today. Patience from not being bored. Like we mentioned in the start of the class, the shaitan will come and cast boredom upon you to deter you from ibadah and from good deeds. So you have to have patience to resist that. Also, you have to have patience in what you're all doing here. What you're doing here. You have to have patience in learning, to learn, if, if, in, 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 and everything. For example, in ibadah, if you take a huge jug and pour it over a plant, and you finish that jug, and leave it. What happens? Or is it better to go to that plant and every day pour a cup or two and then the next day pour a cup to you? Which one is a better scenario? 
to pour that huge jug and just leave it, or every day pour a cup or two. That plant will never survive if you pour the whole jug and just leave it. You must pour a cup or two for it to stay alive. Among the shaitanic tactics is that sometimes he lets one go forth in some ibadah. Someone kneeling to Islam, or he may listen to a khutbah or a lecture. Suddenly he wants to do qiyam from Isha to Fajr. That's why in my talk on the ultimate pleasure of a believer, the one on Qiyam, I said start, but start slow and gradual. Matters that start gradual and continue are better than that big lump sum that you do at one time and that's the end of it. That big jug that you pour and just leave the tree. The shaitan may let one do Qiyam all night so he can pour all the water he has. So the next day and following days and weeks and years, you won't do nothing. Islam is a step-by-step -step process. So you have to have patience to resist boredom in the shaitanic tactics in ibadah. Like ibadah, for example, you need patience in what you're doing here. What you're doing here is learning. You see someone coming so eager and passionate about learning, then a few months later, that passion for learning Islam and Tawheed and all that suddenly dies and fades away. You need patience, that's why. Sometimes there's a reason behind it, and sometimes it's totally from the shaitan. I know many, many who, for example, want to go to Medina. And you know there's an application process. They're passionate about applying. And time goes by, by the time they send their papers in, and by the time they get accepted. By the time they get accepted, their passion for talab al-ilm has faded and died away. And they don't want to go no more. That's why Al-Khadr kept telling Musa in the Quran, إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ صَبْرًا You're here in a noble cause, طلب العلم. So you need patience. You don't learn Islam overnight. It requires persistence and patience. Sometimes you must be patient with your teacher. You got to take that. I've sat in front of some shiuch. Four years I can remember some, one of them. I don't remember, I've seen a smile on his face. And if you ask him, when you ask him, then you have to ask him. The chances are slim that you're not going to get scolded and embarrassed. But that never caused us to leave their sight. Let me tell you, Sheikh uh, uh, Ahmed uh, Batah uh, asked a famous Sheikh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nasr al-Aqil. Nasr al-Aqil, he has a master's and PhD in Aqidah. Uh, very knowledgeable in Aqidah. Uh, he taught generations. He was asked, who's the most knowledgeable in Aqidah? This Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed, is asking Sheikh Nasr al-Aqil, who's the most knowledgeable in Aqidah? Sheikh Nasr al-Aqil said, I don't know anyone on the face of this earth more knowledgeable in Aqidah than Sheikh Abdullah al ghunayman He has a PhD. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah al ghunayman I actually believe that to be a very accurate statement. If not, maybe, you know, very, very, very close to it. Actually, it's, it's more, more, more very, very accurate statement. This Sheikh Abdullah al he, he taught me and my father before me. And when he taught me, I used to frequent his house a lot. Uh, my father called him at one point and requested that he teach me. And in addition, he, he, uh, he taught us in the Islamic University. He was uh, uh, a teacher there uh, in the regular curriculum of the Islamic University. He also had a chair in the Haram where he taught at times three days a week between Maghrib and Isha and at times uh, four times a week between Maghrib and Isha. And I also frequented his house. I may be mistaken, I don't want to put this on my account, but looking back at it, I don't think I've ever seen him ever smile during my stay with him or my study with him. I actually once took a friend with me to his house. I, had, I was going to go learn something and I took a friend. I tagged along a friend with me. My friend, during our, when we were talking, he asked a question. And he got scolded real badly. When we got back in the car, he said, don't you ever bring me here again. He was, he was tough. He was tough. And, and it's, inshallah, it's because he wanted to raise people properly. Maybe it's his nature. I'm there to learn from this giant. And that's what it is. May Allah grant him and my father a long life full of deeds and barakah. The point is one needs patience in every aspect of learning. 
Today, if you don't baby your students, one loses patience suddenly and he's gone. And, and you'll be lucky if you don't find him posting something negative about you if you don't pamper him or her. Keep patience between your eyes. It's a journey. You're a journey on Talab al Alim. And you need patience for it. And that is what you got to keep. The final comment for the deep students of knowledge is uh, it pertains to the comment the author mentioned at the end of the surah. He said, Al-Shafi'i rahimahullah qala al-Shafi'i rahimahullah law ma anzal Allah hujjatan ala khalqihi illa hadhi surah lakafatum. Law ma anzal Allah hujjatan ala khalqihi illa hadhi surah lakafatum. He attributes this statement to Al-Shafi'i. The author said, Al-Shafi'i said, if nothing else but the surah would have been revealed and nothing else, this would have been sufficient. Okay, there's an issue with this statement right here. Note, first of all, note the statement. What's meant by the statement is not that we don't need nothing else but the surah. What is meant by those who quote this statement is uh, you don't set the Quran aside and just take Al Asr, is that this is like an outline. What's meant is that the surah is sufficient to show you an inspiration, an outline, an encouragement to direct you to the path of guidance and salvation. That's what they mean when they quote this, so, uh, this quote. And notice I say what's meant by the statement if some scholars use it. Since I don't believe that this was the exact word in Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Uh, this as it is quoted in this booklet, I don't think it's the exact wording of Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah. This statement as mentioned in Usul al-Thalatha is nowhere to be found by a chain. Uh, one of my shiuch, a great muhaddith, Sheikh uh, Hamad al-Ansari rahmatullah alayh, he's a great imam from Mali. And he, uh, he left Mali at a young age to escape the French terrorist back in the days. And he landed in Mecca, in Medina, where he continued his studies. And he's a very prominent alim. Uh, amongst his students are Ibn Jibreel is a student. Bakr Abu Zaid is one of his students. Salih Ali Sheikh is one of his students. Uh, Sheikh Umar Fallata and uh, Atiyya Salim, both of who were my teachers, are his students. And among his students is uh, Sheikh Salih Suhaimi. Uh, this Sheikh Hamad al-Ansari, uh, he died rahmatullah alayhi uh, in, uh, uh, I believe it was 1997 or close to that. Uh, uh, based on uh, many, uh, let me say before I go on, based on uh, many requests when I mentioned these ulama, many wanted to know more. And inshallah, if we have time, I'll mention a short, short glimpse on these giants of Islam to revive their mention because they're the leftover of the followers of the Sahaba. And because when you know about the true ulama, you'll end up knowing who's a alim and who's not. Anyways, when I asked uh, Sheikh Hamad al-Ansari once in his library, he had a library that was open to the public. Uh, about the statement, he said he does not know of any chain of authenticity where that statement as mentioned in this booklet can be found. Uh, and I've heard from another student of Ilm, Al-Bani said a similar quote. Uh, and actually, if I didn't learn but this from Sheikh Hamad Al-Ansari, it would be worth me making dua for him for the rest of my life. And he taught me plenty. May Allah raise his rank to Firdaus. He said in many uh, books that he researched, he couldn't find it. However, in Manaqib al-Shafi'i for Al-Bayhaqi, there's a chain for a similar statement. The statement goes, لو فكر الناس في هذه الصورة لكفتهم. لو فكر الناس في هذه الصورة لكفتهم. If people contemplated the surah, it would be sufficient enough for them. It's a little bit different. However, this proper wording is attributed to a Shafi'i. And Sheikh Hamad al-Ansari said it's attributed to a Shafi'i. This one, لو فكر الناس في هذه الصورة لكفتهم. It's attributed to a Shafi'i with a solid chain, unlike the other statement that's mentioned in this book. 
why? First of all, we, use the, we should use this one because it actually has a chain to it. Second, it's more clear. The statement is more clear as to what Shafi'i is talking about. Also, if you read Ibn al-Qayyim's works, and Ibn Tamiyah his sheikh and Ibn Kathir, and al shanqiti they all mention it, لَوْ فَكَّرَ النَّاسُ فِي هَذِي الصُّورَةِ لَكَفَتْهُمْ They don't mention it like it's mentioned in this booklet. So now, why did the author here say the other one, which is, لَوْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ حُجَّةً عَلَى خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا هَذِي الصُّورَةِ لَكَفَتْهُمْ Why did he use that? If the correct one is the one in Bayhaqi, Manaqib uh, al-Shafi'i, why, why did the author here use it? Uh, why did he use that? Why didn't he use in this booklet, لَوْ فَكَّرَ النَّاسُ فِي هَذِي الصُّورَةِ لَكَفَتْهُم even though the Fukkar and Nasfiyah, the surah has a chain, and the, the, the meaning is more clear. It may be, maybe that the author here quoted the meaning and not the word for word verbatim of what a Shafi'i did. And if you look into the works of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and those who mastered the work of the Imam, the author of this booklet, at sometimes, you know, when you study someone's books for so long, uh, uh, you get to know a trend of how he writes his books. So some of the ulama said that he quotes by meaning. So there's no problem in that the fact that he quoted by meaning, but we should stick to the one with a solid chain because the, the, it ha first of all it has a chain and second of all the meaning is more clear. Wa jazakumullah khair. We went too long, a little bit too long, but alhamdulillah we did a portion of what we're supposed to do of Tafsir Surat Al-Asr.